Marxism Collective, which is based out of Chelsea College of Arts. This was something that Dave Beach facilitated for many years, and it was a coming together of all kinds of effervescent thinkers and doers. And Kim really stuck out as contributing from his particular area of expertise, which is thinking about the political legacies of institutional critique and conceptual art, as well as art activism. He is well regarded as an author, and if you're looking for a way into his work, I highly recommend his paper on dissensus and the politics of art, which is something that uh, was recommended to me and um, I think is incredibly useful from the perspective of socially engaged practice in particular. Without further ado, Kim. Hello, and uh, thank you also for the invitation to speak uh, to Dave and Malcolm. Um, okay, so, um, so I'll, um, I'll just jump straight in. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today, uh, as Marsha indicated, is, is to we'll try and situate some of uh, a response to Dave's work uh, in, in relationship to legacies of institutional critique, uh, conceptual art uh, of the 1970s. Um, the political significance of arts economics was intensified during the period of conceptual art uh, from the late 60s until the mid 70s, say, as a periodization. There were obviously um, attempts to shift the power relationships between artists, producers, and purchases of works of art, such as the avertissement used by Daniel Buren after 1968, or the artist's reserved rights transfer and sale agreement, which we see there in its original form and, and its uh, final form, which was drafted by Seth Siegelau and Robert Kojanowski in 1971. Um, at that time, one of the reasons artists became interested in econ economic issues was because the market for recent art had grown by the late 1960s, so that work rapidly appreciated in value without any of those gains returning to the producer. And obviously such rosy circumstances were a long way from artists' current economic struggles, uh, but the example of this moment remains an important reference for a uh, range of recent practices that are addressing arts uh, and uh, artists' economic involvement with institutions um, and you know, uh, their equitable remuneration. There was other work done at that time that <coughs> remains highly relevant. And as an example, I will look at two closely related essays by the Australian conceptual artist Ian Byrne, both published in 1975, uh, The Art Market, Affluence and Degradation from Art Forum, and Pricing Works of Art, published in The Fox, a short-lived journal which was established by Art and Language New York. Uh, it ran for three issues. See it here. It's, I don't know. I've got it the wrong way around. We'll see it in a minute. That's Ian Byrne. Um, in these essays, Ian Byrne asks how artworks should be priced and comments pressingly on the emergence of a speculative market for new art. Uh, these issues clearly remain current, and this paper will be an opportunity just to reflect on their significance in the light of Dave's uh, study of arts, economic exceptionalism, art and value. So, in the art market affluence and degradation, and just to say this is a, a, a steal from uh, a music language, nine gross conspicuous errors is very well. I recommend you what people watch it. It's quite an interesting uh, take on, uh, it's a performance of the uh, mid-1970s by art and language in which some of the issues that I'm about to talk about come up in quite an interesting way. I don't think we'll have time to show it, unfortunately, but it's, it's easily accessible on the internet. So I just skipped miles away. Right. So in the art market affluence and degradation, Byrne argues that the transformation of the art market in the 70s had alienated artists from the freedom that their labour is supposed to represent. The changes he refers to are various. The emergence of a speculative market for recent art in the wake of minimalism is the, least, is the central issue. Artists' alienation is a consequence of, in his terms, quote, internalising an intensely capitalistic mode of production, end quote. 
As Byrne puts it, quote, the historical relations of up-to-date modern art are the market relations of a capitalist society, end quote. So some quite familiar formulations that are at that time starting to kind of coalesce. The essay Pricing Works of Art builds on this argument to inquire into the mechanisms that control the pricing of artworks under capitalism. Byrne makes a concrete proposal that the only conceivable way that the art that art might be freed um, from its relationship to capitalist property relations would be to establish art as a non-investment area, as he puts it. Investment, in his argument, is linked to, quote, art bureaucracy, a jungle of paper experts separating the producers of art from the owners of art, end quote. So the issue of alienation in this essay becomes subordinate to the question which starts the piece, how should prices of art be determined? This is a question not so much answered as left as a provocation, perhaps because Byrne is not sure that it's possible to create a new mechanism for prices without replacing capitalist or capitalism altogether. He is sceptical of claims, then current, that artists should be waged, which he describes as, quote, quote swapping an exploitative situation for a more exploitative one. Whether or not he was correct in this judgment, and it was somewhat controversial then, even, um, these debates, it's important to say, fed into a wider ranging um, questions about politics of art, which, which were you know, taking place around the Fox, um, all within the context of readings of Marxism. But whether or not he was correct in that judgment, the essay is prescient nonetheless in its identification of changes within art at that time. For example, Byrne points to the Business Committee for the Art, set up in 1967 to advise corporations on their art investments. He likewise names early art investment vehicles, Madarco and Artemis, designed to profit from rapid rises in the prices of new art. He identifies that these developments depend upon manipulation of the exchange market for art, or the exchange value of art, which in turn affects artists' relationship to what they produce. As Byrne puts it, the result of this, quote, the result of this can only be further capitalisation and cultural inflation in every sense, end quote. That this analysis should arise at that point is notable given that the full-blown symptoms of art world speculation and the link between finance capital and art are not usually held to have geared up until the 1980s. Fundamentally, Byrne's argument seeks to reconcile two opposing positions. So here's the fox. Um, and these are two quotes that I'm just going to kind of uh, dwell on for a minute. On the one hand, he acknowledges that artist labour is different in kind to wage labour. In Pricing Works of Art, he writes, quote, artists' refusal to put a per hour rate on what they produce seems to reflect the fact that artist labour has never been commoditised. And yet the opposite view is also maintained in the strongest terms. So in the Art Forum essay, as you can see there, while it may once have seemed an exaggeration of economic determinism to regard works of art as merely commodities in economic exchange, it is now pretty plain that our entire lives have become so extensively constituted in these terms that we cannot any longer pretend otherwise. Not only do works of art end up as commodities, but they, there is an, also an overwhelming sense in which works of art start off as commodities. So, um, Dave Beach, in his work, Art and Value, addresses this essay by, um, uh, by Ian Byrne and, and draws upon this kind of contradiction, um, also saying that it's situating it within, you know, as one of the kind of itches that his book wants to scratch, this question of how something might be commoditized but not commoditized, the, addressing it as a kind of attention that seems to exist within questions of uh, art's labor, you know, the labor of art. And Beach goes on to explain that the idea that art is a commodity or that our experience is commodified has no sound basis in Marxist economics, calling to question some of the most extensively used leap motifs of left-wing cultural criticism. Art is not a capitalist commodity because art is not produced by workers who sell their labor to capitalists and so on, as we've heard at the outset today from Dave himself. 
Beach's wider point, I think, is that the economic reductivism inherent in much criticism influenced by Western Marxism, or the tendency toward that, does little to resist the aggressive economic reductivism of the neoliberal juggernaut of cultural economics, which supposes that all cultural and political discourses should be translated into a supposedly more objective language of economic calculation. Of course, Ian Byrne was not to know this in 1975, well before the increased influence of cultural economics uh, in the 1980s. Byrne risks economic reductivism precisely in order to heighten the political stakes within art, because species of formalism still held sway in the art world even then. He suggests at points in pricing works of art that art has been made bankrupt by its pro proximity to market concerns, saying, quote, no art is independent of specific forms of society, and our contemporary art is probably a good reflection of this society in most of its mo more dehumanising states. In another essay from The Fox, Don Judd, co-authored with Carl Beveridge, another famous essay from, from, this, you know, from that publication, it's clear that Byrne regards Judd's work as the prototypically alienated um, development of 1960s art and its strong claim to autonomy actually enforcing passive viewer relationships and subtly affirming US cultural imperialism. The essay is written in a personal address to Judd and is reported to have infuriated him, which is unsurprising given its blunt judgment, quote, your form of art represents a final stage in the reduction of art to a mode of capitalist production. And <laughs> <laughs> um, Byrne and Beveridge argue that the only response to the collapse of art into capitalism is, and then another quote here, changing to a form of art that presupposes radically different social relations. End quote. And this, broadly speaking, was the goal of Art and Language New York as a collective. The programme finds its way into Byrne's economic analyses of art um, also. So returning to affluence and uh, degradation, Byrne writes, impending economic crisis has forced many deeply lurking problems into the open. He's referring, of course, to the economic crisis of the middle part of the 1970s. He's writing from New York. And he tends to see the emergence of the artistic district of Soho during that period as a sign of the increased hold of capitalism over art, but also within these kind of potential crisis conditions uh, that he, he, he kind of identifies there um, to the possibility for creating new political subjectivities. And he writes, um, the development of a factory-like community which sustains and encourages an exploitative market also creates uniquely different social conditions for that community and in turn may lead to social and political awareness of the power of community. And it was in the community or art producing collective that Art and Language New York saw the potential to counter the pervasive ideological effects of capitalism, those alienating effects that, that, you know, that, that kind of Byrne was kind of driving home. Indeed, this was the research programme of the Transatlantic Art and Language Collective, because there was also a group based in the UK, of course, although political differences resulted in a split of that group by 1977. So the reason I thought it would be useful or interesting to kind of go back over that is because over the last decade, the 1970s has become a key point of reference for political struggles undertaken by artists. The Art Workers' Coalition, the Guerrilla Art Action Group, Women Artists and Revolution, Hackney Flashes, among many other collectives, have been explicit points of reference for the interpretation of recent work that blurs the boundaries between art and politics and economics by groups including Wage, Working Artists in the Greater Economy, Arts and Labour, Precarious Workers Brigade. Some recent assessments of the 1970s in the light of this work seem in my mind to mirror Byrne's analyses. So to cite an example, in the essay Sick Sad Life on the Artistic Reproduction of Capital, Kirsten Stakemeyer writes, quote, it is the real subsumption of artists under capital which transforms them into producers of contemporary art. 
And it is this process that in turn gave rise to independent artists' organisations of the 1960s and 1970s, while implicating artists in the dramatic social struggles of their time, including most notably... Um, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> the anti-Vietnam War movement. OK, so for Stoutmeyer... The real subsumption of art is the precondition of art's politicisation in activist art and, more importantly, feminist art. This argument is developed further in State Meyer and Marina Vishmit's Reproducing Autonomy, Work, Money, Crisis and Contemporary Art, which is an excellent book, um, and makes an important link between art, autonomy and reproductive labour. Burns factory-like community and State Meyer's real subsumption use the same motif to affirm that art subjection by capitalism leads art into a political engagement. Obviously, this logic is derived from Marx's account of the proletariat, though Stakemeyer and Vishmit make the important distinction that art is aligned with reproductive rather than productive labour. The, the problem raised by art and value is whether real subsumption is an appropriate one to use in this context. So I'll see if I can just round off by just kind of addressing that, which I think is an important provocation, which is made by, by, by Vici's book. Simply put, art cannot be subject to real subsumption if its production is not even subject to capitalist labour discipline. As Beach puts it, the real subsumption of labour establishes a capitalist mode of production with the division of labour, the employment of machinery, the centralisation and intensification of production on a large scale, and the transformation of the production process into a conscious application of science and technology. The emergence of Soho in New York saw artists occupying buildings in Lower Manhattan that had been vacated because light industry they, that they were designed to house had moved out elsewhere. Although the relations of production did seem of art did seem to change in some important respects, artists did not become subject to division of labour um, so much as they challenged it nor did they become wage labourers in respect of their work on art. However, one needs to be careful. One implication of a strong claim to art's economic exceptionalism is that art is entirely irrelevant to changes in the capitalist system, a mere sideshow to the traumatic rending of social experience that capitalism enacts. This seems to be as wrong as the common mistake of relaying political analysis and exhortation through recent contemporary art history. So what I'll say just to round off this kind of slight, slightly truncated discussion, which is my own fault, um, <laughs> is to just to, that I think that the periodization of contemporary art um, and the consideration of the 70s within it is it's significant because I, you know, I think it is significant the emergence of neoliberalism as a political project is dated to the 1970s. Indeed, that David Harvey sees New York as a key test site for neoliberal policy after the city's <coughs> bankruptcy in 1975. Um, that, you know, Gregory Gillette makes a compelling case for the interaction of art and crisis tendencies and neoliberalism in his forthcoming book, Delirium and Resistance, also tracing many of these tendencies to that period and using... New York as, if you like, a way of kind of thinking about the emergence of these elements of cultural neoliberalism that are now very familiar. But also that there is an important kind of element of challenge involved in, uh, in inquiring into the use of these um, economic terminologies, especially insofar as they're used in historical explanations. Um, I th uh, which I think Dave's book does an important service in bringing to light. Some criticisms of art and value, Sven Lutikin's essay, The Coming Exception in You Left For You, for example, have read it as a classicist return to Marx, which is removed from current concerns. In fact, I'd argue that it opens up a space for dialogue about how to respond to the crisis conditions that are now emerging. In the 1970s, Economic reductivism was a challenge to formalist orthodoxy that served to emphasise the political and social dimension of art production. Under neoliberalism, the financialization of everyday life, it has become the norm to relay all values via an economic explanation or justification. 
Neoliberalism has tended to progressively undermine any appeal to non-economic values in its attempt to provide a supposedly value-free and efficient form of government. The results of the policy are self-evident now as liberal democracy threshes itself to pieces from the top down. So underlying these chaotic developments, there are economic determinations, of course, just as art must always be linked to the social and economic character of its production. But this economic last instance is mediated in complex ways. And I think that um, challenging or challenge within the kind of terminology that's used within these sorts of um, art theoretical debates about art's relationship to capitalism <coughs> might allow reconfiguration of art theory to respond to the radically different political conditions that now present themselves. Thank you. speaker is Julie McColden, and she is coming to us from AN, the Artists Information Company. Uh, she's the project manager for the Paying Artists Campaign. When I first met Julie, she was um, holding a baby, and the baby, this was her new baby, was wearing a t-shirt that said Paying Artists, so it's good to get the uh, young generation uh, early on, that's for sure. As if Julie doesn't have enough on her plate with A.N. and her growing family, she also is a practicing artist working collaboratively and uh, more individually, I would say. And I'll just read you the name of one of her recent works because I think it's really fantastic. Even after the collapse of civilization, there will be product placement and power ballards. <laughs> with that, I'd like to invite Julie to come on up. Thank you um, for that introduction. I should also mention that my baby is objectively beautiful. <laughs> um, yes, my name's Julie, and I am primarily an artist. I'm also um, a web editor of Visual Arts Southwest, which is part of the CVAN network. I'm an associate lecturer at UWE, and I also um, moonlight as a project manager on the Paying Artists campaign for AN, the Artists Information Company, which is an organization that has um, 21,000 artist members. And I'm very pleased to be here to represent the campaign, um, to tell you about it and why it's important, and to tell you about our exhibition payment guide and the difficulties that we faced coming up with um, a, a potential solution for the problem of paying artists or not paying artists. And there are copies of the payment guide just down here, and there's also a box um, at the exit. So please do take one. Um, now, as an artist, one of the questions I get asked most frequently after what do I paint is how do I make a living from my work? Which always leads to a slightly awkward conversation because I then have to confess that I don't make a living from my work. Um, and I can kind of see my status as an artist diminishing in the eyes of the person that I'm speaking to. But while I think most people are probably aware that the life of an artist is a precarious one, what they don't know is that the majority of artists in the UK earn less than £10,000 annually. And what they don't know is that artists don't receive payment for exhibition as standard. And the stats on this are really quite striking. Um, from our 2013 research, we found that 71% of artists reported receiving no fee for their exhibitions in the previous three-year period. A further 59% hadn't even received expenses, which means that they're not only out of pocket, but they're effectively subsidizing organizations. And 63% had even turned down exhibitions because in a similar fashion to unpaid internships, um, these things cost uh, uh, time and money to be able to undertake. So obviously the question of exhibition payment is a pertinent one for many artists. When you, um, when you look at the creative industries, there's a gargantuan void between the £80 billion success story of the sector and the actual poverty um, that the majority of artists and writers and musicians and so on 
are living in. And yet that success depends in part on the free labour of these cultural producers. And we have all been complicit in um, sustaining this exploitative situation. Now, there was a time when there was a, a, a degree of social protection for everyone, artists included, and artists could sign on for periods of time to concentrate on their work. Now, obviously, the long-term impacts of austerity policies, which are felt by everyone, not just artists, are often compounded um, for artists um, by, the, by the low income nature of much part-time work and by the overheads of their practices. So continuing to be an artist is increasingly unsustainable and choosing to be one in the first place is becoming the reserve of the few because of changes to education. So you have the, um, the English baccalaureate which has made art subjects non-compulsory then there are the rises in tuition fees and the emphasis on employability. And the consequences of this are not um, just on the individuals themselves, but because artists uh, tend to produce works that are reflective of their own experiences and perspectives, these financial and cultural barriers affect the kind of culture that our society produces. Essentially, it becomes increasingly homogenized by artists who come from one place, a place of privilege. It limits what art can be. It limits diversity among the people who produce it. And if we shut out less privileged voices, we will all be culturally poorer as a result. So basically what I'm saying is, it's hard to be an artist right now, and there's a lot at stake, so we should all be concerned. Now where does... <coughs> exhibition payment fit in, it certainly can't change this on its own, but it does have a role to play in producing a more level playing field where artists know they can rely on exhibition payment as a matter of course. We're not saying that artists are going to quit their day jobs or their second jobs or their third jobs, but we are saying that exhibition payment could contribute to an income stream. So initially, at AN, we commissioned some research, and it was really based on um, a hunch that artists weren't being paid. There were murmurings um, amongst our membership, and the issue was taken up by Air Council, which is an advisory board that informs um, AN's programming, and it's made up of artists who are based around the UK. And um, Whilst obviously artists know about their own particular experiences of being paid or not being paid, because people tend not to talk about uh, their payment or non-payment, and because of the lack of transparency overall, um, no one could say how widespread this was. Now once, that, um, once those claims were substantiated, the Paying Artists campaign was born with the aim of securing payment for artists when they exhibit in publicly funded galleries. So we, um, we conducted two years of research, which included um, national surveys and consultations with over 2,000 uh, stakeholders, as well as um, artist aw awareness raising activities, which is what some of these slides are about. Um, and we found there was a number of very complex issues and a multiplicity of voices, all disagreeing on all of those nuances. And, um, but thankfully and overwhelmingly, agreeing on the broad principle that artists should be paid. So we had something to work with, but we also had our work cut out for us as we began to unravel some of the problems. So a few of the central I issues that came up were about um, whether or not organisations had a responsibility to pay artists and what for exactly, when it was okay for artists to work for free, and where is the money actually supposed to come from. So, first of all, on the question of whether public, publicly funded galleries have a responsibility to pay, well, yes, I think they do. Um, it's, it's taxpayers' money, first of all. Um, and publicly funded galleries benefit from all of the unpaid work that artists do to produce their work. Um, that, and also from all of the underfunded activity that takes place in the artist-led scene. So there's a very large pool from which galleries in the funded arena can cherry-pick. So in a sense, galleries 
and by extension the salaried positions they support, are dependent on artists. And when you think about it, if everyone in the organisation is being paid, from the cleaners to the directors, rightly so, then shouldn't the artist whose work is at the centre of it all also be paid? Notwithstanding unpaid internships and the, the, the trends to turn invigilate, paid invigilators into volunteers, I think those positions should be paid as well. Um, galleries have sometimes made the exposure argument, which everybody here will be familiar with, and other organisations have claimed that they are supporting artists en route to the market. Which leads to the question, at what stage can, can an artist expect to be paid? As well as, um, is the market supp supposedly like a final destination? Um, and it's worth noting here that, um, that organisations who have the greatest ability to pay also tend to be the organisations who have the greatest ability to offer exposure. So it creates a kind of... Um, you know, a, a weird situation where smaller organisations would have more of an onus to pay um, cash to artists. So, a second issue is, what is the payment actually for? How can you have a one-size-fits-all approach to monetizing something which is unquantifiable and endlessly nuanced? For example, is the work in the exhibition a simple, straightforward hire of an already existing work? Or is it a commission? Is it a solo or a group show? Is it on for a weekend or two months or is it a permanent artwork? Does the artist produce a new work every day or one a year? Is it for sale? Is it part of a collection? Accommodating all of these eventualities is obviously impossible. And what it means is that exhibition payment cannot be in exchange for labor because artist's practice is too varied to standardise it. And in any case, it's difficult to quantify how much labour goes into an artist's work when it could take years for um, an artist to arrive at a particular piece. Neither can it be in relation to quality, because that's tricky to define, let alone measure. It's also subjective and diverse, and it can't be, which can't be reflected in a standardised way. Ditto success. We argue that payment acknowledges an artist's material need to be paid and can be made in simple recognition of their contribution to an exhibition and through that exhibition to the wider success of the organisation. Thirdly, what about artist-led projects? How do they fit in? These are um, you know, groups, of, groups of artists who choose to work together because they want to do something. They're often self-funded, sometimes they're project-funded, but they usually work, operate on a voluntary basis, which raises which raised the question, when is it okay for artists to work for free? And a, a frequent misconception about the campaign was that it was saying that artists shouldn't work for free. But of course, there are loads of situations where artists um, can legitimately do just that. And artist-led projects are some of them. And nobody wants to see that kind of activity come to an end. What we found in our um, focus groups was that while um, paying artists wasn't always possible, artist-led projects tended to have good models of practice when they did have funding, and certainly good intentions overall. And what they seemed to be governed by was a simple sense of fairness that basically boils down to, if someone's getting paid, then everyone's getting paid. And if the organisers had funding to pay themselves, then they made, they made sure that they had also applied for funding to be able to pay the artists that they were working with. And we think it's important to recognise that this activity is different from the work of publicly funded organisations. And the Paying Artists campaign has produced a manifesto that outlines best practice for paying artists in the artist-led field. And it consists of the following. They should acknowledge the contributions that artists make to making their projects happen. They should be upfront about their budgets and whether or not they can afford to pay. They should pay whenever there is a budget and never expect artists to incur unreasonable costs. And they should be clear with artists about what they are being asked to do 
by putting it in a straightforward agreement, written agreement. And lots of artist-led projects are doing this already. So the million dollar question, where does the money come from? How do you pay artists? In some respects, the answer to that is very simple. You pay them in the same way you pay anyone else, a curator or a director, for instance. Artist payment has to be considered as a core cost of an organisation, a non-negotiable. And I think that's where the shift takes, actually takes place. It's in, it's in people's minds. And that's why artist-led projects has some of the best approaches to paying artists, because they understand the financial pressures that artists are under, and they prioritise artists' pay in their budgeting. Of course, they also have um, much simpler budgets and fewer overheads. And I think what can happen with larger organisations is that even when they have allocated for, um, for artists' fees, they can become swallowed up in their more complex finances. Nevertheless, 95% of organisations agreed that artists should be paid, but they weren't necessarily doing it or doing it consistently, or they didn't know how to make it happen with the funds that they had. So based on our research and in addressing some of these questions, we've produced the Exhibition Payment Guide, which offers a set of suggested payments to cover a wide range of exhibition scenarios and guidance for implementation. And it reflects a desire from both artists and organisations for flexibility. Thank you. So, okay. Now, please don't ask me how we arrived at the figures that we have, because I won't be able to give you a, a satisfactory mathematical answer. What I can say is that they are informed from a number of different things. So firstly, actual fees paid by organisations uh, to artists from our case studies and our consultations. Um, a set of anonymised data that we were given by Arts Council England that provided um, provided information from 100, 166 regularly funded organisations um, and it showed the, the sort of total number of exhibition days, um, the, the exhibiting costs of the organisation and the total turnover of the organisation which helped us to be able to categorise them into different groups. Um, um, but what's interesting to note there is that there isn't a set of data available on what organisations pay artists because they don't have to report on that and they don't have to put a budget line in for it when they apply for funding. And it also took into account the financial needs of artists. So in terms of the guidance, what it comes down to is four core principles and they are transparency. We think it's absolutely vital for artists and organisations to be, to be able to understand each other's financial situation. And for organisations, that means you know, having, a, having a payment policy that is published or made available to artists when they ask for it. And um, for artists, that means understanding and communicating their own financial needs. Budgeting. Use the exhibition payment guide to identify fair payments and then put a budget line in for it when applying for funding. Negotiation. One of the things that came, came up again and again was that artists didn't want to broach the subject of payment because they were worried that it would um, impact on getting future opportunities. It's a difficult conversation. And so the negotiation is designed to make that difficult conversation easier. And we encourage artists to simply ask organisations, what is your payment policy? And finally, written agreements. Just get it in writing. And if that sounds straightforward, then I think it is. For some, it won't go far enough. For others, it will go too far. Has it got teeth? It's supported by arts, council, arts councils in three countries. Northern Ireland al already has it, uh, its system um, via Visual Arts Ireland. Arts Council in England are expecting MPOs who have just recently ha had to reapply to evidence their approach to artist payment, and that's a step in the right direction. On the question of money, some tough choices may have to be made, but if, organisa if organisations are budgeting for artist pay, 
and funders are awarding it, then we believe it can be implemented over the coming years. There's also good news in the form of the Museums and Galleries Tax Relief, which comes into force in April. It has to be used towards exhibition budgets, and we hope that that will increase the capacity of organisations to pay fees. Over the next five years, we're going to be building upon this first edition. So we're launching a, a paying artist working group, working with national organisations uh, like Engage and festivals like Liverpool Biennial and studio groups, etc. And that's going to help us to grow it and develop it. And we're going to be collecting information from organisations about how they're paying artists and from artists about how they're being paid. And we'll use that to review the fees in 2022. So the practice of not paying artists has been ingrained for too long, and we need to work together as a sector to rectify it. Organisations need to treat payment of artists as a core cost. Funders need to make sure the projects they enable are paying people fairly, and artists need to expect and be able to ask for a conversation to take place and be able to negotiate. We believe that a fairer system of payment will ease the financial difficulties faced by many artists and lead to a more diverse sector, where in years to come, we'll still be able to access art which reflects the broadest possible spectrum of human experience. Thank you. Thank you both for terrific talks. I have a lot of questions. However, I think I'm going to start by asking if any of you have burning questions. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to ask him a question that relates to those two Ian Byrne quotes. It'd be slightly easier. Ask it if the quotes are on the screen. Is, is it possible to get them up, or, or should I do it without? Uh, yes. Maybe I'll start asking it while you're doing it yeah. to avoid taking loads of everyone's time. Um, the question was that, um, so there, there were those two quotes from Ian Burn in 1975 from two different essays, yeah. and you presented them as being, as uh, producing a kind of contradiction. Now, I can see why they seem to produce a contradiction, but there's actually nothing contradictory about them at all, because they're talking about different things. One, the, the first quote is saying that the artist's labour has never been commoditized, and that's the point that Dave Beach makes in his book, basically, which, which, is, which is correct, right? But the second one doesn't talk about labour, it says that the artwork, the work of art, is a commodity, which is a different thing from saying that the artist's labour is commoditized. Now, art, many artworks are commodities, right? Because commodities are things that you produce to exchange. And many artists' what works are produced so that you can exchange them. Um, and th this, is, this is one thing, one issue I'd like to sort of put pressure on in, in Dave Beach's book is that it sort of moves from this, this correct point about saying that the artist's labour is not commodified to therefore saying that art is not a commodity and we shouldn't really talk about commodification because it's not a useful term because art isn't a commodity. But in fact, like, the fact that artworks are commodities um, has, a very, has a massive everyday significance for lots of artists. Like I work in an art school. And, for example, lots of the students are told that they should really make very finished products. The sort of ideology of, a, of an aesthetics of finish, because finish is what you do to make a saleable object, right? Or their time is massively impinged upon by the fact that they're... For example, when you, when you make things for exchange, you might have a schedule where you have three exhibitions coming up, and you have to make things very, very quickly for those exhibitions. Um, and, and that means that you don't have the kind of free-flowing, creative time that we imagine artists are supposed to have. So the fact that their artworks are concretely commodities does really affect just an artist's life or the aesthetics of their work. So I'd be interested to hear, hear any reflections on that or whether we could still maybe keep the idea of commodification even if we're saying that artists' time is not commodified. Um, yeah, uh, a couple of things there. So uh, the, the kind of... The, the tension that I was referring to is, I suppose, that he says in the second quote that they start, that they work, hang on a second, <laughs> in which phrase they like start off as commodities, you know, uh, meaning, which I un understood to mean, you know, when they're being made as well, you know, so that uh, that would seem to overlap with the question of labour, but that was the way I was interpreting it. I take your point that maybe there's a different way of seeing it. Um, I'm not saying that you that there need 
we need to get rid of the idea of commodification. I think that what just interests me is that uh, it's really not the correctness or otherwise of the uh, application of Marxist economics within these art, uh, in Kuwait or emergent art theoretical debates of the mid-1970s. It's just that what the artists were trying to get at by posing these questions in, in this way. And I think that um, uh, I think that actually what's important about Dave's work from my point of view, as, as, as I tried to state, is it just allows that question to be asked rather than you know, these just being almost semi-invisible kind of routines of talking about the political dimension of, of, of art. So I absolutely concede and agree that, that there are many of these kind of determinations that, especially within an art school context, have, an, have a, a, you know, are part of what's shaping people's experience. And in, in, mm. and in that way, I think that, and I think that's part of what Ian Byrne was trying to get at through this kind of formulation. And in order to do so, they were drawing, not upon Adorno actually at that point, which is quite interesting, but, but really probably more on Lukashian um, concepts as well as other new left stuff, um, because Lukács had been translated into English in, in the early 1970s, uh, the history and class, class consciousness had. So, so those are the kinds of points that I'm just sort of playing around with, if that, if that answers some of, your, some of your questions. If we can think across both of the presentations, on the one hand, the uh, historical, theoretical, on the other hand, the, the practical, the material, although I don't want to suggest these are mutually exclusive, I'm struck by the fact that both of them are grappling with writing by artists for artists. These are resources for mm. artists. And this is also something that is explored quite extensively in Dave's book is sort of, you know, how writing valorizes um, art and other forms of cultural production. And I'm intrigued uh, by this reference to the art school because uh, there are many of us here today who are working in art schools, writing out of art schools, writing about art schools. I want to acknowledge training for exploitation, which is the precarious workers' brigades new counter curriculum that is trying to unlearn, uh, Andrea talked about unlearning earlier, unlearning the whole employability agenda that um, is being uh, mapped across education. And I guess I'm really intrigued by how we can resource as educators, as artists, as others, how we can resource and mobilize these texts in, in practical ways, in imaginative ways. Uh, I guess that this also connects with Dave's book because I, you know, I want to see it activated and, and sort of um, doing amazing things in the world. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on that with reference to your respective <coughs> texts that you've been talking about. Yeah. Um, well, uh, is this working? Yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of things that we can do to I mean, I think there's a, a lot of things that we can do um, to empower um, students for for un knowing what to do in these types of situations. And I think um, I think first of all, um, we need to be honest with them about what the what the sort of situation is in the in the art world and in the real world. Um, I think that it's important to have an understanding of how how the system works. Um, in order that you can make informed decisions and um, and try to navigate it as best you can, um, there's obviously AN has um, has hundreds of resources in terms of practicalities like everything from you know how do you work out your daily rate um, to you know making a contract, um, and there's obviously the exhibition payment guide. Um, which can help to, to make negotiations if you get an exhibition in a publicly funded gallery. So, um, so yeah, all of this. And AN as well is interested in kind of developing its relationships with HEI, so, um, so there's probably some opportunities for working together. Yeah. Um, <coughs> uh, yeah, I really like that. Um, publication. <laughs> 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 um, I've just read 
a little bit of it. Um, and I think it's a really pointed intervention in obviously a very contradictory institutional space. Um, I think that for me, working in higher education, um, one perceives the way that, uh, uh, that, that many of these contradictions come from the fact that educational institutions are being placed in a sort of false market competitive situation which is increasingly chaotic at the same time as they're being required to demonstrate that there's economic uh, benefit from what they do uh, in order to um, offset the amount of money that is being paid on student loans or being backed by the government on student loans and so on. Um, and there's this kind of whole spiralling kind of sense of a situation that isn't really in anyone's control, I would argue, or it's kind of there is there is a sense of crisis within within the within the whole competing range of issues that are involved, and of course at the sharp end of that are um, students as well as the staff, and it's difficult sometimes to kind of find uh, points of solidarity there because I think the whole system is really meant partly to pit students and staff against each other and in order that they don't start to kind of see themselves as in a similar situation. Um, and I think that's an interesting, really interesting way of intervening in that situation with lesson plans. in art schools uh, or in, in HE is the desperate creation by the government of markets where none actually exist. Things like the teaching ex excellence framework are attempts to create hierarchies and seeming markets where there is no market. So, you know, one, it's easy to make that assumption that it's a market when it's been, you know, forced into existence and it doesn't actually exist anymore. Uh, as regards to two quotes, I just think to come back to Dave's distinction between capitalism and capitalism, uh, we all live in the world of goods and this is where we've been since the 18th century, but that isn't quite the same thing as uh, a capitalist mode of production. Uh, well, I'm not sh we, we, Yeah, I think that <laughs> if what you're saying is that maybe some of the kind of language that Marxist terminology was being misapplied mm -hmm. at that time, then yeah, I agree. And, and in fact, that's one of the things that well, I have time to get into it, that one of the, the, the arguments between art and language was the criticisms by Art and Language UK that were made of Ian Byrne what were to try and kind of, well, well to kind of uh, question that use of terminology and some of the contradictions within the argument, but also to reorient the discussion in, in, the, in the direction of class struggle, which is not what's present within the question of uh, the, the emphasis on alienation in these texts. It very quickly shifted there over the course of the three issues. Other questions? Andrea. Sorry, I could shout. Um, a, a very quick question. I wondered how. That's not me. <laughs> I, I, I wondered how um, you see the, uh, this paying artist guide in relationship to the wage campaign. I mean, uh, the, the, the working artists for the greater economy campaign that was mentioned earlier on. I mean, do you see yourself working in the same way? Because it seems the working artists for greater economy campaign would seem to be much more, if you will, ideologically framed than, than this. Yes, and I should say that I have read a lot about wage, but I've been on maternity leave for nine months, so all of that information is um, is, uh, is quite far away now. But they, um, I know that they they they're very interested in labour, and I think that their 
model relates to um, the like that they pin the they pin what they pay artists on the turnover of an organisation, and they have a kind of kite marking system yeah. um, where um, organisations who kind of meet the requirements of wage get a kind of a stamp and um, they're kind of an approved organisation. <coughs> So, um, and um, uh, the Paying Artists campaign is a, is a campaign organised by an organisation. Um, it's an organisation that itself is funded by, through public funds. Um, well, partly funded through public funds. Most of AN's um, income comes from its membership. It's 21,000 members. Um, and um, and so, so in a sense, in a, in a way, actually, the campaign has has two lives because it has this the organisation's kind of campaign and what it's doing, but then it also has a life of its own um, that you know that can't really be controlled. Um, and um, and and in some respects, well, that's absolutely great. Um, and in other respects. It, it has caused some misunderstandings, certainly around um, the question of whether artists should work for free or not. You know, so, yeah. that is a super interesting, complex um, question that I think we should um, explore later on in the day because we're running out of time. But I think to acknowledge that, in addition to having A N here and. Um, Precarious Workers Brigade's new curriculum is a resource for all. You can download it online for free. There are also representatives here from Artists Union England and I'm sure many other organizations besides. So lots of us are working on these issues from various different angles and it seems to me like the real challenge now is to build solidarities, to mutually inform each other of what we're doing and to continue the struggle. I'd like to thank both of our speakers for their terrific talks. Thank you very much. Time. So, uh, quick comfort break, whatever, but we will start again strictly at 10 2, so seven minutes. <laughs>